The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. Make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Well, I have Rich Miller of da Data Center Frontier here in the QTS Experience Studio. You're like a unicorn. Like you're really, <laughs> you're everywhere. I see you everywhere, but to track you down and to corral you is a uh, is challenge. You know, you don't look that nimble or agile, but you're pretty. Uh, you're pretty elusive. Thank you for coming in. Hey, you are so welcome. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, the place has uh, very much changed since the last time yeah. I was visiting here at, at QTS in Ashburn. Uh, so I'm uh, glad to be able to come down. And uh, as you know, I love talking about data centers. Uh, we have been having conversations with folks about it uh, yeah. all over the place lately. And uh, uh, and it's always great to be in Ashburn because this is the, the home in the cloud and, and sort of uh, a really great place to, to get a good take on what's going on in the industry. Yeah, I, I could agree more. Um, I actually did run into you recently at an event, a couple events, as a matter uh -huh. of fact. And one of the things I noted to myself was, you're a busy man. Um, you're everywhere um, in a high demand. That's, that's interesting that if I say, for example, yeah, I've got Rich Miller coming into the studio. Everybody knew who you were. Every single person, connectivity, cloud, data center, whatever. So I didn't know if you did a calendar spread in your youth or something, <laughs> but everybody knew you. Um, and the second was you were really working. Like, you know, not all of us work as, so, you know, we do our panels or we do our things, but uh, you were really, everybody seemed to embrace you showing up. Um, and uh, I thought, well, that's pretty remarkable. When are you running for president? That's what I want to know. I, I am not. I've, I've seen that job and I, I like <laughs> mine better. I, you know, for me, the, the conferences like uh, the ones that we've been to, or right. PTC or, or CapRate, yeah. are tremendous opportunities to talk to a lot of people, have a lot of conversations. Because uh, with the work I do, really trying to understand the industry in depth, what I've always found as a, as a journalist, and I've been a journalist for, for almost 40 years now, mm -hmm. is that having a wide variety of conversations is really important to be able to fully understand an issue. Uh, in something like the, the data center industry, you'll see a variety of perspectives on any topic. And so with Data Center Frontier in particular, what I'm trying to do is understand Which trends. Which is a, your periodical. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's website. my website. Yeah. I've, I've been covering news in the data center sector for about 20 years now after nearly mm -hmm. 20 years working in newspapers. And uh, over time, the, the industry has evolved and my, my work has evolved when I, I founded Data Center Knowledge, another mm -hmm. website covering the industry in 2005. And it was very much focused on, here's the day-to-day -day news mm -hmm. of an emerging, sort of exploding industry mm -hmm. at the time. With Data Center Frontier, what I'm trying to do is take sort of a deeper dive into some of the topics that are uh, shaping how the data center industry uh, makes decisions about where it builds data centers, how it designs them, what the uh, business drivers are for all of this. Uh, and so for me, a room full of data center people is the best place to be because sure. I can just go from uh, conversation to conversation and get a lot of different perspectives. And, and many of the panel sessions, some people are bored with them, but for me, I always find something that helps expand my understanding of the industry. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, I, I get around. I'm working hard at those conferences, uh, you know, but I can like, just walking between one session and another, I could have three or four conversations sure. in a hallway that help me, you know, understand things or identify things that I hadn't thought of. And, yeah. and I just think that's a blast. I'm having a good time. You know, when you were talking, it reminded me of, in particular, these last few conferences that we've gone to, when people hear data center industry, right? Um, and we're in a data center now, which really is a technology company disguised. You know, like we all are disguised as a data center. Or I was talking to somebody the other day that's in forklifts. They're like, we're a technology right. company disguised as a forklift company because we're deploying our technology through these through infrastructure, right? Once upon a time, doorbells were doorbells. They're not doorbells anymore. They're 
uh, software or edge devices disguised as a doorbell. But it, but in your and this isn't an infomercial for you, but I I want to start this because I think it's sure. amazing. One of the things I think you're fantastic, and what I love about the events that we're going to is there is conversation about the apps and the algorithms that are taking place in this world of data. There's conversations about the connectivity and next-gen connectivity and last-mile connectivity and how we move or don't move data and how we protect it, how we build the infrastructure, which are the data centers that they live, whether these teeny tiny ones we're thinking about, the micro or the edge, or what are those going to look like, um, to the massive big core where data is mined and um, tremendous value and trends are, you know, AI and machine learning can really come to play and, and everything in between. <clears throat> and so if we think that, you know, data, I've heard it referred to in many ways, I just think it's the ideas of the world, the most valuable commodity, business commodity anyway. Uh, and they live in data centers, which I think then make data centers the most valuable real estate on earth. But all of these things have to come together, the apps, the algorithms, the connectivity, and the events that we go to and the things that you write about aren't just how we get better tilt up walls right. or or more airflow but it's this whole it, it also you know you've written a lot about um i don't necessarily want to say like the moral implication but you know how do these evolve how do we become good stewards around whether it's sustainable energy or next generation design so that we're we're not impacting our environment whether it's how we consume the power or how we build data centers within our community. So we'll get into some of that today, but I really admire now that I've come to see one, how spry you are. So it's <laughs> very impressive, but uh, just the thing that you guys write about, you must have a phenomenal staff that helps you. Uh, actually, we are a very compact organization. It's wow. my, myself, my uh, uh, colleague, uh, Kevin Normando, who's okay. been my business partner and my wife, Colleen uh, okay. is a, uh, a huge help with our social media and and our our new podcast, the Data Center Frontier Show, and we have a number of contributors who help fill in the blanks. Mm. But uh, you know, I couldn't agree more about the importance of data and thinking about how it's changing our world. Mm. Uh, the for me, the data center prism, uh, it, the data center rather, is a is sort of a prism that we use to look at this digital transformation. That's it's really changing our world. Right. And, uh, you know, I think everybody experiences that simply in the things that, that happen in their everyday lives. They understand data, the devices, how the shift to uh, an online digital economy uh, is impacting everything they do. Nobody is making less data. Right. Everyone is using more data, and the Internet and online services are playing a larger role in their lives. A and that... Uh, we think of uh, what's happening, the sort of revolution uh, th that digital transformation represents as streams of data mm. uh, that are all coming together into this river and then kind of a tsunami. Mm -hmm. We've talked about data tonnage, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's one of the, our big themes for 2020. Um, at the beginning of every year, uh, we do a package um, of the eight trends that are going to shape the, the year ahead. Uh, and uh, we just kind of put that together for 2020 and have been talking a lot about them. And one of the big ones is really just the amount of data uh, and how to manage it, use it, store it, uh, and, and find the value in it to make mm -hmm. business decisions. Because mm -hmm. just as I might look at the calendar on my phone to figure out where I have to be from moment to moment, mm -hmm. businesses are, are also working through enormous volumes of data to try and pull out the things that help them understand their customers, their their industry, and how they you know make more money and, and be be better companies. Yeah. And that's data centers are the underpinning of all of that. Right. Um, but there's there's fascinating sort of points of data within that large universe trying to to look at the incoming streams and figure out which ones are going to matter. Uh, which ones might have implications from a societal uh, mm -hmm. level, as, as you discussed. Um, so there's a lot going on, but I think it's important work, and I think helping understand the data center and its role in this really societal transformation is, is really important. Well, let's, let's pause on that um, for a few moments, if you don't mind, on 
you know, the trends for 2020. You've, mm-hmm. you've written about some that have captured your imagination. And starting off with the first one, uh, which is really interesting to me, I've begun to learn a little bit about data tonnage, data gravity. And they, they can mean different things to different people. When you think of data tonnage, what does that mean to you as you understand it or you write about it? What we're really talking about when we say data tonnage is just the volume of data that's being created and the implications for, uh, for data centers in, in uh, how, we, how we handle all of mm-hmm. that. There's, the volumes of data are just uh, increasing at an explosive rate. So when you say volume, are you talking about data packets that are moving across networks or are you talking about data at rest sitting in – storage devices, and it seems like it could be either of those or uh, both of those. The answer is all of the above. Okay. Um, really, mm-hmm. when we look at the, the sort of digital transformation, mm-hmm. what that does is we have devices, sensors, uh, business analysis, artificial intelligence. Data has really become, you know, it, it's almost passe to say data is the new oil, mm. but it, it really is the, um, it's at, side of, at the core of everything that's trans- transforming business, transforming modern life. Mm. And uh, it manifests in different ways. And as the, the data center operators have to kind of get their arms around all of it, it has uh, implications for mobile devices, what kind of power and chips you have on the mobile devices, mm-hmm. what kind of storage capabilities you have. I don't know if you've experienced that thing where you're taking, uh, you know, the n- amount of photos and videos you're taking sort of max out the capacity on your phone. Right. But, but I do. And then <clears> there's <throat> network implications. How do you move data off the phone, off right. the sensors, uh, you know, out of the factory? Uh, <laughs> and off I, of airplane engines. I've know. also experienced that where, I, you know, I've taken this picture that I love. Right. And I go to move it off of my phone. I want to do it wirelessly or easily. And it says, no, you can't. It's too big. Wait, is it? It's in, it's in phone photo jail? You know, you've got to connect it to, uh, you know, a high-speed cable or whatever. Um, I, as you were talking about this, uh, all these devices and all of this stuff, recently I was having a conversation with someone I was trying to explain you know, just this randomness of data that just everything's generating data. And the, per, the example that I came up with was the Roomba. Do you know what the Roomba is? Uh, we have one. It's a, it's a <laughs> so little vacuum. That it's, it's well, around. I don't know if it's a vacuum, but it pushes dirt all over my <laughs> kitchen. But um, I read an article. I forget where it was. I, I almost want to say the Wall Street Journal, but it probably wasn't. But just this article. And one of the things that there was a concern was, this allegedly, was the Roomba was reporting back information back to its manufacturer about, hey, you know, um, even if it's not true, it's scary enough that uh, you're like, whoa, kind of thinking about it. Is this thing mapping my house? And then what if that data got tied into a Zillow or a whatever? Like, here's data that I just think it's pushing dirt around or trying to, you know, clean. My cat loves it because it's it's autonomous vehicle, right? It gets on it and just the rides, rides around. The, yeah. the cat rides the Roomba. Um, and always, you know, my cat always has this look of disdain, like where it's going. If it starts bumping into stuff, it's like, yeah, I meant to go there. Just ride, I have a big giant Maine Coon, so it's riding its Roomba autonomous vehicle. But it's generating data. It's sending it somewhere, either right. now or in the future. And so that's just one more thing that's creating data that lands somewhere that has to be structured and organized. And there's a privacy question there. There's a, you know, um, what are they doing with the data? Did I release that data? How much data is that going to occupy in a storage array? How much power does it take to uh, receive and, you know, on and on and on from my cat's autonomous vehicle, right? It just... uh, it, it's crazy time. And then with my kids, they have – have you ever heard of this thing called Neon Cat? Do you know what the Neon no, Cat I, is? No, I, now I have to look that up. Look it up. N-Y-A-N Cat. This is a true story. It's a Pop-Tart and a cat head gif. I can understand why it's probably not in your lexicon. I learned about it just recently when I was doing an article on data gravity. 
At one time, allegedly, it was the fifth most watched video on YouTube. Hundreds of millions of views. It spun off of it a huge business on Amazon merchandise. Sure. It created its own game in Steam. It, uh, a Bitcoin, true story, $4 million market cap Bitcoin called Neon Coin was spun off of a GIF mm -hmm. that a guy made on a lark and threw it up on YouTube. And if you imagine the amount of energy needed for those hundreds of millions of people to watch that and all of the Etsy stuff and Amazon stuff and game stuff and Bitcoin stuff off of that GIF, where is it stored? How is it consumed? How are those packets move? So I have a perfect sort of example of this. And, and the, the short version is that there are a million stories of your Roomba and other devices that right. – are all sending data back mm -hmm. and you don't know exactly what piece of information uh, your Roomba is going to generate that right. might be useful to, uh, uh, to the iRobot folks. Right. Uh, but they have to sort that out. So <coughs> I did a, 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 an interesting story this week which I think illustrates a lot of these trends, okay. which is about TikTok. I don't. Oh. I don't know if you're aware of TikTok. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. That's where. That's where most grown-ups are with TikTok. <laughs> uh, so it's a a short video service. It's a successor to Vine, where they're like you know uh, five yeah. to twenty second videos. It started out as a lip syncing service, uh, or folks doing karaoke, so right. participatory music. But it has exploded in popularity, yeah. uh, and uh, to the point where it's. Uh, it's generating memes that then become uh, Grammy-winning uh, songs. That right. I, I, because I, I sampled a little TikTok uh, you know, <laughs> to write the, this story, uh, now I have Old Town Road stuck in my head because <laughs> TikTok was the, uh, was the service that launched that entire thing. And right. you know, that, that's how it all got started. And then it was atop the Billboard charts for 17 weeks. Right. But the thing about that is that's a service that didn't really exist until about 18 months to two years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, in 2019, TikTok leased nine megawatts of data center space here in Ashburn. Uh, that's a very substantial uh, chunk of uh, space. Right. That, that has taken something that really uh, didn't even exist two years ago in a meaningful fashion. Right. And now they're almost into double digits in terms of, you know, data center requirements in, in the, you know, premier uh, market in the, in the world, really. So that's just an illustration of how, you know, the, the small ways that uh, we use the internet and we use online services uh, taken at scale have a transformative effect on uh, infrastructure. Mm. And to be able to get the data off of your Roomba or to store all those TikTok videos, it all requires uh, network and compute and storage and large buildings and generators and UPS units. And that's the, the importance of the world that, that we cover. Mm. But, you know, uh, Roomba and TikTok <clears throat> are just two small slices of the many larger stories of how data is transforming our life. And just about everything that we do all day long has data implications. And, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations that are going on right now are how do we build and plan the infrastructure to make all this happen right. and how, we, how do we do that profitably right. because, you know, nobody wants to – uh, to build infrastructure to lose money, it's a, an expensive undertaking. Right. But um, what's very clear is that the collective explosion of data is generating uh, all kinds of demand for, for data center space mm -hmm. and figuring out exactly what that looks like. And as I've said, what we need to build where, particularly with some of the network uh, mm -hmm. Uh, on this is uh, is an ongoing challenge. Uh, you know, um, data gravity is related to data tonnage. I don't know if you're familiar with that idea. Mm -hmm. McCrory, um, I think it was uh, 2010, threw this idea out there. I just became familiar with it a little over a year ago. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, when I th when I, many of the people that I talk to, hey, are you familiar with data gravity? They're not. When you explain the big idea, right. it makes sense. And it simply is that in the same way that 
you know, when something of mass becomes big enough, it it exerts a force. <clears throat> In the physical world or the Newtonian physics world, that's gravity. And McCrory's deal was when you have data grow to a sufficient size, the mass, and you have these other things that enable it, bandwidth and latency, but really it's about the mass primarily, the data primarily, at some point it gets so big and so unwieldy, structured or unstructured, that the force that it exerts is like gravity, where instead of pushing the data to the service or the app, you pull the service and the app to the data for proximity. Are you involved in, have you ha had anybody talking about how they're trying to solve that, either in storage or in sure. networking? We've written a number of stories about data gravity, and a number <clears> of <throat> companies in the sector have really identified this as an important trend that's guiding how they think about uh, customer <clears throat> requirements and where they place their data centers. Mm. Uh, proximity really matters. Right. And when you get large data sets, uh, if you're going to analyze them, there's going to be a lot of data flowing back and forth between the, the data set uh, and the compute that's analyzing it. Mm -hmm. And this is where the network piece comes in. Uh, you know, the, the speed at which you do it, you know, we're working with the speed of light here, essentially, right. in terms of oh, how you move the data back and forth. And when the data sets get large, it is so much easier to do it if the compute is close to the data right. as opposed to if it's further away. Right. So that's guiding a lot of decisions about where this sort of analytic portion of AI and algorithms uh, is taking place. Mm -hmm. In AI, you tend to have uh, two functions. There's training, which is where you, you know, give it all the, the data, you feed the algorithm, and it, and it learns. And then there's inference, where it then makes decisions based upon uh, all the data that it's consumed. Right. And for training in particular, being close to data sets and being able to, you know, have a lot of compute power right at hand right. is really important. Plus, I think it's <clears throat> a little bit more economical. Somebody said to me, it is cheaper to make a packet than to move a packet. Well, that, that really begins to become a factor. And so what you see <clears throat> is uh, what that means in, in practice is more uh, collocation space, large footprint collocation space that can both uh, store your very large database or data lakes mm -hmm. and then have the compute nearby to analyze it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the concept of ecosystems and, uh, you know, large footprint colo that's tethered to network hubs mm -hmm. uh, has become uh, a sort of architectural uh, approach that a lot of people are very focused on right now. And there's even some providers that are saying, hey, we're going to build a multi-tenant data center that's right next to a certain provider's yeah. large cloud campus because we think there will be enterprise users who will want quick access to the data that they're storing on that cloud. I've heard that as well. One of the areas that I think is really taking advantage of this was an early adopter were um, the e-discovery folks. So you've got you know, so much litigation and right. so many, th not that we have much litigation in the United States, <laughs> but you have, you know, it's all digital form. Even if right. they go out and they do an investigation, it's all recorded, it's put in a data set. And there are firms now for e-discovery that have to sort through all of that. And you don't want to be, one, you want a chain of custody. So you don't want it moving over networks or putting it on drives and moving it around. Um, and so this idea that I can, even if I get temporary co-location space, I'm just in that data center. Right. The law firm may be, a, you know, in a different physical location, but I've got a fiber cross connect and I'm within a, you know, a few feet or a few dozen feet. Uh, but under the same roof, and I'm right here or right next door or whatever, and then I can I can mine that, and that's much easier than being across town or coming across some, uh, you know, some distant location. So sure. we're seeing that sure. a lot in e-discovery. And and think about that. E-discovery is you know maybe uh, if uh, you're listening to this, every email you write is profound and filled with information. Usually the, is the fact of the matter is is that the email where you know my wife <laughs> says, "Hey, remember to feed the cat," right. is right in with all of the other ones. Right. You know, I use, you know, Gmail among other services right. and you know, nobody goes through and deletes their email anymore. Right. 
And that's then true. Even you know, if if storage is unlimited, right? Really, then it it changes the behavior of how you manage all of it, and the whole question of of whether it gets deleted, when it gets deleted. Uh, it, it results in larger data sets. Right. And in something like eDiscovery is a good example. All of that has to be searchable, um, whether it's structured or unstructured. Right. And so the network piece is that moving all of that data is expensive. It does have implications. And sometimes to be efficient from a compute perspective, you just – you have to be able to, to run the process uh, – in a reasonable amount of time. Right. And that's just so much easier if the data set's <clears throat> right there. So it is, uh, it gets into shaping uh, the clusters of, uh, you know, clouds and, and data centers that we see, uh, which then has impacts in the real world. We see, you know, data centers <laughs> come together in places like Ashburn, like the different parts of the Phoenix area. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know that then begins to have uh, you know impacts on the community. What right. what are data centers like as uh, uh, as tenants in the community, as parts of the community? Mm. You, you know, we got a discussion here in Loudoun County about whether data centers look pretty. Right. Uh, <laughs> some some residents believe that some of them do not. Right. Uh, others, uh, you know, uh, and. QTS is a pretty good example of this. I was just down in the lobby, and it's beautiful. But uh, some data center providers have worked hard uh, on that. But it's just a, a, an example of how data and the explosion of data and data tonnage and data gravity all have implications in terms of you know, how we manage it, what that looks like, what kind of buildings we create to store all of it mm -hmm. and to do all of this, and what they look like in the real world. One of the um, one of your topics of your trends mm -hmm. was uh, districts, data center districts, and you're yeah. you're, you're kind of touching on that. I think a little bit. Sure. Um, uh, before we go too far into it, somebody um, we were at an event recently. I don't know if you heard this, where one of the one of the providers said they're in a, another country, I believe, and they said, you know, our citizens. Uh, we're particularly fond of, you know, they look like these uh, Soviet era, 1940, you know, whatever buildings. I, I didn't see the picture, but I started laughing at the at the description. And they invited, um, I may get it wrong, I think it was Google, but, but, to, but somebody to come out and, uh, you know, in, in the same, I don't think it was them specifically, but inspired by kind of that look like come out and paint tasteful graffiti and just make this this almost like a, a work of art well it's it's more the it is Google uh, okay and what they're doing is that they're actually hiring uh, mural artists okay. to use the large you know sides of the data center as right. a canvas right and to create uh, and and all of the the murals that they're painting are connected to the the place where where they are right. to the to the local culture, right? Uh, and I love that idea. It's it's simply an acknowledgement that you know, for too long the data center has been the large concrete bunker, right? And uh, you know where uh, design sophistication became using different shades of gray on the right. side of the building, right. you know, and and we still see that some places, but that's sort of an acknowledgement. That maybe we've got some some work to do on that, and a right. very creative uh, uh, way to to do that. Right. And and yes, Google got some interesting publicity. I right. sure wrote about that when it happened. Yeah. But um, y you know, that's one of those those ways in which we think about how the data center interacts with the the community and the world around it. So, what is a when you write about a data center district? Uh -huh. What is that? So, a data center district is essentially uh, a area where you get a concentration of data centers and it has mm -hmm. implications for property values, mm -hmm. for uh, local uh, zoning and planning, uh, and even uh, e economic development and, uh, uh, you know, local, uh, I won't say tourism, but, but local understanding of, of the, the, the community and the business landscape. So the the form of, of data uh, data center districts that first got my attention is a trend that we're 
going to be seen shortly in Ashburn, but it's you can it is in full display in Santa Clara, which is one mm-hmm. of the other big data center markets in Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. which is you get a number of data centers in uh, a industrial district, and over time, any of the other businesses around it wind up getting purchased by the data center uh, provider, and they just knock the buildings down and put up a data center simply because the value of that property, that land, uh, for data center use exceeds all other uses. Mm. And uh, uh, Santa Clara is a particular example because it's a, a it's not a large town, mm-hmm. but it's sort of the hole in the donut from a power perspective. They have their own municipal utility, Silicon Valley Power, and it is uh, slightly less expensive, actually meaningfully less expensive than the areas around it that are served by PG&E, mm. which has a lot of issues right now. The utilities in bankruptcy and is facing, uh, you know, liabilities <clears throat> that could easily lead to uh, bigger increases in the, mm. the price of power. So as a result, everybody wants to be in Santa Clara, mm. and the economics of being there are very different from being in the cities around it. So there are places in Santa Clara where data center companies have. Uh, systematically bought the properties around them, knocked them down, built new data centers. And uh, the recent trend is the data centers are getting taller. It used to be that you didn't see anything above uh, two stories in uh, Santa Clara, and now they're building four-story data centers Mm. because you want to get the most out of every square foot of property available. Right. Um, in some cases, they are, are paying you know three million dollars and more uh, for an acre of property, wow. and so they're trying to uh, get the most out of it. Because right. in some cases, you're essentially buying a building that a few weeks ago somebody was using as their headquarters or something like right. that, and and putting a data center there. Uh, and we're seeing that in Ashburn as well. Uh, there's uh, you know properties not far from here around the sort of central interconnection hubs in town where a couple of properties have been bought at you know, valuations that uh, were, uh, you know, exceed records uh, simply because they're close to the, the big internet intersections. Uh, and there's, there's a church on one of them. There's a, a, a business building on another one. And those are ultimately going to be uh, demolished to make mm-hmm. way for, for new data centers mm-hmm. over time. Mm-hmm. And that's simply a, a sort of strategic Im- imperative uh, that is driven by by business, but it has a, a, a sort of quality of life and, and community implications. Mm-hmm. So if the community is concerned about the appearance of data centers, one of the issues that's come up is like, well, maybe we don't want them lining all the major highways and thoroughfares, right. and we can concentrate them geographically in ways that make sense. If you do this over time, it creates the opportunities to do more interesting things. Mm. Like, um, you know, one of the things that you see in in, uh, Europe a lot is district heating, Mm. where they take the uh, exhaust heat from data centers, uh, from the the hot air thrown off coming Mm -hmm. out of the back of the servers, they aggregate it and they use it to to heat homes and businesses. Mm -hmm. That's something that doesn't happen here in the United States. There's a couple of tests. Uh, Amazon's doing a, a program like that in Seattle. Mm. Uh, but there's, it creates lots of possibilities. And there's even been some discussion uh, you know, here in Loudoun County about, well, maybe we can you know, have some signage or something to promote the understanding of the data, data center alley and right. its impact from economic development and, and all of that. But um, I think... As data centers become more prominent parts of the the urban and suburban landscape, uh, that it's getting the attention of local officials and the community, and that I think is going to lead to more intentional uh, thinking about uh, where these these uh, properties are located, uh, what it means to the the property values in those places, and what kind of infrastructure you need to support it. Right. Uh, one of the biggest data center markets in the world is Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. And they've paused data center development simply because uh, the demand of the power grid mm-hmm. is so substantial, and they have a, you know a certain amount of electricity available, and they've kind of taken a, a moratorium for for a few months to think about you know what parts of the city are equipped to handle 
data centers and right. whether they should steer that and how the infrastructure should support it. He, here, and that makes sense to me, but I'm wondering, you know, as you're, as you're um, laying that out, on the one hand, those are all the great benefits. But if we concentrate, you know, earlier, it's my assertion that <clears throat> the ideas of the world live in data centers, you know, the mm-hmm. formula for Coca-Cola may also be physically written down in a safe, but it's probably in their data center or somebody's data center somewhere, right? One hopes they have that. Well, I that. sure hope so, because um, I don't want to go through new Coke 7 or whatever the, the latest gen is. <clears throat> but in all seriousness, it, you know, the NSA said a number of years ago, cybercrime will be the greatest transfer of wealth in history. Now, people aren't, they're probably not a smash and grab, you know, risk. Uh, f- but but if you if you put all of these facilities on the same couple substations and the same sort of geographic area, uh, you and I both know, in particular with hyperscale and large enterprise, they're always talking about physical threat. And many times that's weather or a flight path or a, you know, a main. But do you think that, that there's an, you know, by not having these infrastructures dispersed around a geographic area where they may be all in the same grid, but they're entering the grid at different substations and different physical points. You know, you're not, if you've got them all in a five mile square radius, you think there's a greater threat of risk to uh, sabotage or anything like that to that area? Or is that much ado about nothing? So I, I'm not going to say that it's much ado about nothing because mm-hmm. it's a serious topic. At the same time, we've been dealing with these kind of uh, risks for a long time. There was a lot of discussion of this in the data center industry <clears throat> after 9-11. Mm. Uh, I live in New Jersey, and uh, so there, I know locally in the New York <clears throat> area, there was a lot of discussion of, you know, what is the concentration risk that you have from data centers? Uh, because what it turned out was that a lot of companies that played a key role in the economy mm-hmm. had their, you know, their primary data center in Manhattan and I, their secondary or backup data center was either, you know, further down the street in Manhattan. They might have moved it to Brooklyn, and that right. was their idea of diversity. Right. And the controller of the currency and other financial regulators say, you know, that is just not going to work. Right. So we're going to we're going to sort of draw a circle around New York, and and you have to get your backup data centers outside right. the external perimeter of that circle, and which is one of the reasons that you have a, a wholesale data center market in central New Jersey clustered right. around Piscataway, right. because that's where, uh, uh, th- that's where the, the sort of a boundary fell. And mm-hmm. so that's one way in which there's been a sort of regulatory focus on that. Uh, I, I do think that um, we see a certain, uh, uh, that the approach that Amazon takes, for example, where they look at availability zones right. uh, is is a way in which the business itself uh, and customer requirements have uh, taken that that risk assessment and translated that into data center geography. Why don't you pause for a second and describe uh, for our audience the big idea of the availability zone? So the idea is that uh, if your site fails because you have an infrastructure failure at a data center or some, you know, there's a flood or mm-hmm. it gets hit by a meteor or something mm-hmm. like that, that uh, the uh, services can fail over to a duplicate application uh, in a nearby data center. Right. That ge- will be, within geographic proximity, right, it, if I remember correctly. It has to be close enough that the <clears throat> network connections are fast enough to do replication of the site so that you right. have you know a real time version of it, but it has to be far enough, hopefully that the the event that that caused the outage in one place won't extend to the backup site as right. well. So, you know if a if a UPS system you know goes offline, knocks a data center offline, you know you can then uh, engineer your your software so that it automatically rolls over to the backup that might be 10 or 20 miles away. Right. So that's the architecture. The, the Amazon refers to it as availability zones. Uh, other cloud providers have adopted similar approaches to geographic diversity. Um, and they don't say a lot about exactly what their criteria is. Being on separate grids, I think, would be uh, a uh, criteria for, for some of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is sort of the, the way that the business has driven 
that consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, whether or not uh, – I'm careful about talking about uh, data centers and, and security issues sure. because I think that, you know, you got to be careful about putting ideas in people's heads. Right. Uh, but, you know, obviously there's been risks out there for uh, a, a long time. Uh, I think the data center industry has done a, a really good job on physical security. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to, to digital security and uh, hacking risk, uh, you're only as, as vulnerable as the weakest application and the, the uh, you know, <laughs> right. the, the way that, that the application is coded. And right. that is a problem, as we've seen right. uh, a, across the industry. Right. But that's irrespective of where they're physically located, right? I mean, It's a different just, issue. There's, right. there's certain things that as a, as a data center operator <clears throat> that you can control, and there's certain things that's the customer's responsibility. That's a, a core tenet of co-location. It's right. like, hey, we give you power pipes and ping, and then right. whatever goes on inside the cage or the, or the cabinet. Right. That's your deal. That's right. We'll control access. We'll validate who's coming and going. Right. We'll give them certain controls, right, that they're responsible for. But I was just thinking of it as, of the district. On the one hand, I love the idea of, um, you know, it, the vendors would love it. If I'm a storage vendor and I'm going to any one of these, you know, I'm servicing and we're all within a, you know, data center alley or whatever, which sounds a lot like Harry Potter. Like I should buy a wand there or something. But, you know, something like that. Like there's all those benefits and you can you can harden uh, the substations and the, um, you know, the physical electrical grid and infrastructure in that part with those feeds. But also the inverse of that is possibly, um, uh, you know, I, I've narrowed an area of focus if, uh, you know, if I want to interfere with this is the data center capital of the world, which another way to say it is, um, again, if I think the ideas of the whole world live here, then I think data centers are probably the most valuable real estate on earth. You just kind of made that point in Santa Clara. So if I've all got them here, um, by definition, I think that makes it some it raises its risk. I don't want to be too uh, and here's, alarmist. Here's, and I think that's uh, a, a reasonable thing to, to contemplate mm-hmm. and that most folks have contemplated this in the industry because, let's face it, the data center industry is a belt and suspenders type of uh, industry. Right. You can take right. a couple of different steps to make sure your pants don't fall down. Right. And that's totally <laughs> that. the way that that uh, engineers in, in, uh, <clears throat> and folks who design applications look at the entire process. So what we see, as an example, is we've got a huge cluster here in Ashburn. There's a pretty substantial cluster in Manassas. Mm-hmm. There's another one uh, forming in Leesburg. And you're even seeing uh, uh, a meaningful cluster in, like, the area around Arcola down in Route 50 just south of Dulles Airport. Mm -hmm. Part of what's guiding the geography of that is availability zones. Mm. So, you know, whatever the criteria is that people have about this many miles you have to be uh, away from the other site – that we're seeing that in play in mm-hmm. Northern Virginia, mm-hmm. where, of course, Amazon is one of the largest mm-hmm. tenants. Right. But at the same time, in each of these places, you're getting large enough concentrations of data centers that uh, you it's becoming uh, important, I think, to think about how they are deployed, what those districts look like. And in almost every place that, that uh, data centers are, are a major business type, you're going to see this, and yeah. f- partly because of all the data tonnage. Right. We're going to need more data centers, and we and uh, I think over time, even if you have uh, a bunch of uh, dispersed clusters to accommodate physical and security risk, uh, you, we're still going to need to think about what that looks like in in the real world. Well, I've seen it emerging nowhere near like Northern Virginia, but I've seen it emerging in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I've seen it emerging in Chicago. I've seen it emerging in Dallas, where there, um, it, 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 I don't know that it was that thoughtful once upon a time. Hey, let's, because Amazon's availability zone concept came out long after they started AWS. Sure. <clears throat> but I, I, their competitors, everybody loves this idea of being within a certain latency and connectivity. Um, 
um, requirement, but I have enough geographic diversity that my talent, that there's a train derailment and spill, right? Or there's a whatever. I, the, the entire state isn't taken out. The entire 150 mile metro area isn't taken out. But in that area, there is some event in that facility and that whatever the application reco- is the failover. Um, <clears throat> and I'm able to move with some geographic proximity my workloads around. And I'm on maybe the same grid. It's very difficult to get off of the grid that runs up the eastern seaboard or whatever, but I'm in different segments of it that have different, you know, um, switchovers and different substations that feed in, and so I can be isolated from That's, some weather event right. or whatever. That's one of the reasons why you see so many data, data centers in Texas, because they have their <clears> own <throat> power grid, and if you're thinking about, right. you know, we want one that's not going to have a, a, a sort of waterfall failure uh, as has happened on the East Coast. Right. But it's very interesting when, when it comes to the risk equation and what people consider as uh, the criteria that they're, they're okay with or not okay with. There was a time early on in the industry where, you know, the notion of being near airports and, and flight paths you know, was like, oh, well, that's that's no go. But if you look at the major data center uh, uh, clusters right now, yeah. they're near Dulles Airport, they're near Absolutely. O'Hare, they're near uh, Mineta Airport in in, yeah. in, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, it be partly because there's other concentrations of infrastructure there that impact the economics in other ways. That's right. So there's there's lots of trade offs. It's it's a very fluid thing. But I think it's important to have the conversations. And, and I think communities and economic development departments are starting to be more intentional and recognize data centers as a asset type that they ought to think about how they interact with the community. You threw something out at me the other day that really – well, you threw a number of things. I'm gonna, since we're on air, I'm going to keep it, uh, <laughs> keep it, keep it uh, in line. But there was one that you wrote about <clears> – <throat> And I called shenanigans on it. I was like, that's not possible. And it's this idea of on-site power uh-huh. generation. And, um, you know, I have great respect for you. You're a handsome man. Everybody likes you. So I don't want to, you know, push the edge too far. But I, I as, feel polite, the coming here. as I'm politely as I could, I declared shenanigans. <laughs> because I remember there was a really cool book I read years ago called The Big Switch. And they talk yes. about <clears> – Nicholas <throat> Carr. Yeah, they talk mm-hmm. about he talks about this really cool thing. I don't read the last chapter of the book because it's terrifying about what they're doing with all this data, but it's a really compelling discussion. And one of the things he talks about is you know, once upon a time, all major factories in the United States, their power was on site, and there were these artisans, and they were all one offs essentially. And then the central station was created, and less than a generation later, all those. It was much more economical to use a central station and to distribute power that way for a variety of reasons that he goes into. Compute followed the same trend with, um, uh, you know, mainframe, well, almost reverse, mainframe to uh, desktop and now going back to the cloud and whatever. And so to me, it, I, it didn't seem credible. Like, why would we, with all this talk about trying to get to renewable energy, which requires, whether it's solar or wind or hydro, some, you know, there are not very many data centers that have the ability to build these big farms. And you threw out this really interesting sort of, well, hold on, Dave, you haven't considered this. So why don't you talk about why this has come up as a consideration, on-site power generation? So on-site power is something that's been talked about for a lot of years. Uh, all of the hyperscalers, because of the amount of energy they use, have taken a look at it at, at different times. <clears throat> and the economics have always been really difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so in many cases, the cheapest thing has always been to get power from the local utility. Right. I believe that we're starting to see this change. It's happening in small pockets. And it's it's driven by a couple of factors. Uh, one is the limitations mm-hmm. of the local utility. The utility industry is messed up in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have dueling business models. The, as we noted, the, the grid is, is, is kind of a mess. Uh, and the ability to supply renewable energy is one of the utility industry's challenges right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's very clear that the large cloud players, the large data center providers, including QTS, are very uh, focused on providing renewable energy to their customers right. because that's what they want. <clears throat> 
But there's also, so that's one consideration. The other consideration is the risk piece that we talked about before. Uh, and the best example of that is in California, mm. where we have climate risk in, in a way that we haven't seen uh, before in that the wildfire risk there, mm. which is where the drought over right. multiple years is a factor in the increase in wildfires and having them be more destructive. Right. Uh, and that has become a significant liability for a P- PG&E, which mm-hmm. is the, the utility for much of California. Uh, they were cited for having their uh, equipment be a contributor to several fires that were extremely damaging, and as a result, the liabilities have them in, in bankruptcy. And there's a couple of things coming out of that. One is that um, uh, it's anticipated that there's going to be settlements that probably will not make the price of electricity any cheaper. Several of the providers uh, that do business in California in their coverage area have said, hey, look, over the next 10 however many years, we have to expect that the price of of power is going to go up and that that's going to go to our bottom line. Uh, At the same time, uh, last fall we began seeing rolling uh, browning brownouts, sort of temporary service outages, where they just cut the power to address uh, risk of wildfires mm-hmm. because there were windy days, <clears throat> and if the equipment was energized, it would uh, the transformers el- or whatever exactly. Yeah. Or you know, the the result of that was that there are large parts of California where they just turned off the power mm. uh, for in, in some cases a couple of days at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were no data centers that experienced any sort of outages at, at the time, but that's an attention getter. Mm-hmm. Uh, some providers, and, and uh, the example I used was Equinix, has been working with uh, Bloom Energy for a number of years. Bloom Energy makes uh, a fuel cell they're publicly held and have been one of the largest companies in this business and have had a, um, a lengthy outreach to the data center sector to say, hey, you know, uh, the economics of this may be, be difficult, but there's good reasons for you mm-hmm. to think about that. And uh, the, what's happening in California has prompted um, you know, Equinix to, to put these in in a bunch of places. Because mm-hmm. what you see there is uh, there's, there's sort of two issues. One is cost. And if you've got a, a, an area where natural gas is cheap and electricity is expensive – fuel cells start to have different economics. Now, I'm not familiar with, can you describe what the fuel cell, is it actually generating power or is it storing energy? It's what doing it? a little both. But, okay. you know, the idea is that you can take natural gas to, to generate oh, okay. on-site yeah, yeah, yeah. power. You, yeah. could, you could do it. Uh, Apple's <laughs> done some of this, like in North Carolina, yeah. with, with biomass and things like that. I've heard of people doing this up in New England or looking at it. Um, in Connecticut and other places. There's some test sites in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And the reason is because those are places where utility uh, power is very expensive. That's right. Uh, And so in places like New England and New York and California, uh, Bloom Energy has done a bunch of, I think it's about 45 megawatts of uh, uh, fuel cell installations for for Equinix. And they estimate that over the next 10 years, that could save them as much as 150 million, Mm. which gets into real money. Right. but the, the reason that that has become a higher priority is both on the cost, but there's also um, the question of in an environment where the utility can just turn off power for a couple of days, mm-hmm. you know, what is your risk scenario? Uh, how much do you want to uh, place your f- trust in the utility? And at what point do you have to make provisions and say, hey, look, if I don't know what their policy is going to be here or what they can handle, because clearly PG&E didn't plan for any of this sure. to happen, right. that what do we have to do to protect our customers? <clears throat> and in some cases, the, the, there's a lot of discussion that the solution in some places will be on-site power. Mm. Uh, and we've seen a lot of science experiments with this. You know, Microsoft's done some, some things with, uh, with fuel cells. Uh, I think one of the areas that would make this more interesting is if we get energy storage that makes it possible to integrate uh, renewable energy uh, into a large data center campus mm-hmm. more easily. There's a number of, of large investors, the infrastructure funds that have begun to invest in data centers that are taking a hard look at this, mm-hmm. even with things like you know carbon capture or wave energy 
and of course wind and solar. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are a number of, of companies like Switch out in Nevada has, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working with solar. QTS obviously mm -hmm. has done power purchase agreements mm -hmm. in a lot of places. But, um, and have a mix of solar and other things. But I, let me ask you this, sure. not to interrupt your thought too much, but I, <clears throat> as a data center guy, when I think about on-site power generation or even long-term power storage, which for mega data centers is a lot of capacity, um, I, I sound like a pessimist. I don't mean to be. I'm actually a pretty optimistic person, but I almost think like, is that a is that a bomb? Is that like how do you get permitting <laughs> through someplace like California to say I could just imagine that city council meeting? Hey, we want to be able to generate through these massive natural gas or whatever operations. And oh, by the way, we want to store the sun right here to ride through this thing. Are, is that okay? So you know, thumb up, thumb down. You know, here's like, here's an example of that. Okay. The city of Santa Clara and Silicon Valley Power, you know, which have the largest concentration of data centers, uh, made a decision last year that they weren't going to enable, weren't going to allow uh, on-site power right. for, for data centers, which was a blow to, a, you know, there was at least one provider that had, had bought a site. We're in Santa Clara. I yeah, mean, you guys right? are in Santa Clara. Yeah. You know the Not operating people, environment. Right. And, and there are a number of people who were contemplating doing on-site power there. And then suddenly the local uh, utility and and, uh, uh, and the township just say, hey, no, we're not going to do that. Right. California's always been a, a hard place to even uh, – people will tell you stories about generators and trying to cite generators right. uh, there. There's no question that it's a complex issue. Right. But I think what started to change um, is that you see some places like California where there's uh, power security issues in terms of the availability – in Europe, sometimes it's uh, an issue about, uh, as we've noted in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. there are parts of the grid that they don't have uh, uh, power available. There have been temporary challenges in Ireland, in the Dublin data center district. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a data center built with a natural gas generation plant uh, that was installed simply because they couldn't get the power in they wanted in the time that they needed. Mm. Uh, as you know, uh, large players want their capacity and they want it now. If mm -hmm. you could go build a you know, time machine and go back in time and give them fresh capacity, they would love that. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a number of uh, – you know, I'm not saying this is the holy grail or it's mm -hmm. the future of everywhere. I'm saying this is something that we didn't think was going to be a thing. Right. And now there are places where it's a thing. Right. And uh, – there's a, there are problems where on-site power is a viable solution in ways that it hasn't been in the past. And what we see when that starts to happen is that the economics will slowly begin to change. And as you're talking, I'm imagining a conversation that goes something like this. It, it, it's easy for us. I tend to do this. When I think of data centers, I think of large enterprise and hyperscale and these big mm -hmm. cloud providers. But there are... Every, probably every municipality in the areas that we're talking about are in these data centers, mine and others. And that's their 9-11 system. That's their, you know, your 911. That's your um, emergency response. That's hospital medical records. And the, at some point, the conversation could be either I move that to a nearby state. And now I've got state sovereignty questions or, or data privacy and who controls it and how does that go and how does that, you know, state of California employee information or because I got to have it available right. or um, or we've got to figure out a way that I can, with a reasonable certainty, guarantee that um, that this site's going to remain up its failovers to utility or whatever, not just for economic reasons. So where do we compromise? Because it's going to have to be a compromise. But where do we compromise? Do we, within these communities, and maybe not all communities, maybe it's Sacramento and we feel it, find a way to move it back, or whatever, I don't know. Maybe the zones move out of some of these nearby areas. But um, if, we're, if we feel like we're continuing at risk by the providers that are providing us power now for being available, manageable, affordable, you know, um, we've got to do something. I, I think 
maybe I don't like the word compromise, but I think there's a conversation that's okay. going to happen Fair here. Enough. Yeah. Uh, as you know, data centers are usually well acquainted with the local emergency officials because they are the you right. know, they do support nine one one all the emergency things, and so there's a, an awareness of that. Uh, you know, whether it's on-site power or microgrids that can integrate uh, power from a number of different sources. Uh, Power is the lifeblood of data centers. We're becoming very large users. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, there's a very concentrated, uh, very large power requirement. And I think that's going to, uh, the security and reliability of that that power is going to be a big issue going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think the big thing I'm saying here is that that's going to be a larger conversation and that people are going to start to look at and consider and fund new things that might not have made sense before. Mm. And some of the larger financial players being involved in the data center industry uh, could enable that in ways that we hadn't thought of before. It is exciting times. By the way, fun fact, my parents, I think, are the first, were the part of the first graduating class of Santa Clara High school, and if I've heard my dad say it one time, he said a hundred <laughs> times. His dad worked at Moffett Field there. Right. With the, um, they they moved there after World War II, uh, as did my mom's family. So one group came from Iowa, the other came from Indiana, and um, they had my dad work, started his real career when he got out of the Air Force for IBM in San Jose, and I want to say his house, his little three bedroom branch was like 17 grand, something like that, in 1970. And my... Um, it's not 17 grand now. No, it's not. <laughs> but it gets even better. My grandparents had a little double lot off of Emmett Court, which is right in the heart. We were there when Great America was built and all this other stuff way back when. But anyway, they had a little double lot, not a big house, but a double lot with pomegranate trees or whatever, all these fruiting trees and stuff back there. And they retired in like 1982, and they're like, we got like $280,000 for this house. Can you believe it? Like, we're thieves, you know, it's amazing. And my other grandparents lived in Redwood City. If they saw, like, we, I don't remember what the number was, but it's like a million and a half or whatever for the Santa Clara house that got auctioned off. That's years ago. And the San Jose house was like 900 grand for this one and a half bath, three. And my parents just shake their heads. They live in uh, Houston now, have been forever. He ended up uh, eventually manager on the shuttle and space station and a bunch of other stuff. But it was, um, he he just like, man, I should have just stayed there and, you know, flip burgers and done something. But it's amazing uh, how much that place has changed. Look, in a little bit of time that we have left. Sure. The the one other thing that um, there's, I mean, we could go down your list for two hours. I'm not going to do that to you. But I could talk all day about data centers. uh, Well, you know, because it's not, it's not about (laughs) just not just about data centers, right? Sure. What you've talked about, what we've been talking about, is, you know, power that affects all of us and how we're protecting the ideas of the world, and you know, you know, so many ways we could take this. But one of the things you started to write about, or I started to read about is this AI arms race. Mm -hmm. Now, I generally, you know, we will talk and have talked on this podcast about 5G. Uh, um, I'm not a connectivity person, but I've said, and and I know you have as well, and you've written about them, so many different, there's a lot of hype around that. But what I'm curious, because in our business, and, you know, this is an infomercial for QTS, and I know a lot of my peers and frenemies and their businesses as well, we're developing platforms or we have developed platforms that have artificial intelligence and machine learning, in some Mm -hmm. cases rudimentary, but we have it in there now doing analytics and many things. Some are further down the road than others. <clears throat> We've spent, my CTO spent a lot of time back to being a technology company disguised as a data center company. But you wrote this thing about the AI arms race right. alters the compute equation. What did you mean by that? So for a long time, uh, the the chip industry has really been <clears throat> focused around a fairly small number of providers. Sure. Obviously, Intel uh, I- NVIDIA started to change the game. Right. Uh, AMD's AMD, had a bit yeah. of a resurgence. But what's happened is uh, the rise of artificial intelligence has been completely powered by computing horsepower. Mm-hmm. That's been the thing that changed AI from 
sort of a, a, a thing that uh, computer scientists thought about right. to something that can actually happen in data centers right. and then, you know, even now down to, to mobile phones. Right. And the reason that that's happened <clears throat> is because chips have become more powerful. Mm -hmm. And as people have seen how AI can have business impact, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's changed the the outlook for uh, the chips uh, and in a way that there's now this whole horde of startups that are out there creating chips that are customized for AI and in many cases different kinds of AI looking for market opportunities. Essentially, there's a whole new batch of of contenders to uh, the incumbent chip makers who over the next couple of years are going to be rolling out new hardware. Uh, that's going to be more powerful, that's going to use more power and therefore mm -hmm. in some cases create some, uh, some cooling challenges uh, and is going to create a lot more options for you know, heterogeneous com computing, computing mm -hmm. that isn't just here's my Intel mm -hmm. thing talking to my other Intel right. thing. Um, and I think that is, uh, has a lot of potential to have impacts everywhere from the data center to your smartphone. Because a number of these are targeting on bringing uh, computing power into the smartphone that can run all the AI algorithms right there. There's some, you know, between coding efficiency and and more powerful chips, smartphones can do things that you know are pretty mind-boggling. Right. Really, I've seen, uh, you know, machine learning mm -hmm. and AI apps running on phones that uh, that do some some crazy things, right. and that's only going to get. Uh, become a more pronounced trend, right? And that's uh, just with the phones of today. That's right. And, and right? if Sir Isaac Newton saw this, he'd think it was magic. Well, like, it is. It, it is magic. <laughs> What's a, you know, uh, and and you know, it's funny that I heard a conversation yesterday. It's like, well, should we still call it a smartphone? Because yeah. you know, I don't spend too much time talking on the phone anymore. Right. It's really there's a million other things going on, and it's like a a computer in your pocket, uh, and. Those are going to become much more powerful devices, right. uh, and there's some crazy uh, hardware that's being uh, targeted for the data center to process AI workloads there, and yeah. and some of them are going to generate serious heat, uh, and they're coming out of the box with liquid right. cooling. Right. You know, I so I got to spend the day at Nvidia um, in December. And we'll see them again later. And this is not a, a you know, a, a prop for them, but it was fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating what they're doing. Um, they believe that that the to hear Jensen, their CEO, say, you know, the sexy stuff happens at the edge. You go to the cloud first, and that's where the regular stuff happens. The sexy stuff happens on the edge and in colocation and whatever. And I, you know, I support that idea. But it, when you were talking about heterogeneous earlier, heterogeneous chips. Um, an area that I thought was really interesting was, you know, there was uh, two decades ago or so when I first got into the data center business, there was just a chip really, right. maybe running at different um, speeds in the data center. It was a very homogenous environment and pretty much all Intel, very little AMD that was right. more of a gamer thing or a very specialized thing it was all Intel. <clears throat> the, you, just the number of them or the size of them, but it was all Intel. And I agree that I feel like the, the, the one of the areas, you know, we saw this in the mid 2000s to later 2000s with what we now call hyperscale. They began making first what were called pizza boxes and then mm -hmm. just little shelves where they, they don't even repair them anymore. They just, once a certain number of systems within a rack fail, they just pull the rack, right? right? The app just, and the apps, the AI of the system recognizes and balances the, the, um, uh, the production and the workflow or whatever. And if, and if this one just falls out of line, it just shifts the load. And at some right. point, somebody in the future, probably robots, which you've written about. I don't know, we'll get to that today. <laughs> we'll, we'll pull it out of line or whatever and more system, you know, just a new rack. They're not gonna pull out these individual things. And I think there's gonna be a ton of boutique chips where instead of this single cell homogenous deal, you will have chips that perform, for lack of a better word, the function of the heart, the function. And so there will be different sizes. Some will be very high density and generate a lot of heat, but many others may not. And they're, you know, they're all of this 
very um, almost like a body, all these different roles and functions within a um, a suite, a cage, a rack, a data center. Um, we're going to see it in the vendors. You know, we're already talking to vendors about. You know, your your um, let's just talk about generators. Your generators better have the ability for me to ingest that data, to digitize right. that data, bring it into my data lake, and I better have the ability to. It better have published APIs, and I better have the ability to ingest it into my learning systems and manipulate it. And if it's not, if I can't bring that in federated, I'm going to go find somebody who can, and they have their own different chipsets. And it's a it's a fascinating time, I think, and it's it's a it's a wild frontier. And, and I think the best indicator of that is the fact that there are all of these hardware startups. Yeah. Uh, semiconductors is not something that venture capitalists have been, you know, all excited about funding because right. it's really expensive. Uh, it takes a long time to do well. And the prize at the end of the road, if you succeed, is you get to compete against Intel. You, or, or, or Malaysia or yeah. whatever, right? Well, it's just all of a sudden you it's going to – Let's face it. Intel has long – you know, they're, they do many, many things really well. Right. And have a dominant market position to begin with. Sure. And that's got some – but so I think the power of artificial intelligence in the both in practice and in imagination of the apps that can be created from it uh, has been transformative enough that it's gotten all of these venture capitalists to invest in these startups, some of which are going to make some really interesting hardware that's going to find its way into our data centers. And uh, some of them are not going to uh, be managed and cooled the same way that you do the Intel x86 chip. That, I think, is something to watch. Uh, and as you've seen with NVIDIA, some of these chips might be everywhere from the smartphone to the autonomous car to that Roomba that your cat's mm. riding around your living room. I just want them to make the drone that I can fly in. Now, it could be called Heavy Drop because I'm not a thin person. Those just, exist. I know. I've seen them. <laughs> I've seen them. But they just, uh, you know, their weight limit so far is uh, I, I exceed it. So uh, I am I got my Apple and whatever over there. I've got to get to it. But, yeah, I can't wait till I just get in, sit in the pod, push the button, or better yet, you know, you just go into your holodeck, right? Computer, take me, you know, in your like Star Trek or whatever. So, well, thanks for coming in today. What uh, what haven't we picked your brain on in the last few minutes? That you know what? Here's what I I will say. Um, I would invite everybody to to take a look at Data Center Frontier because I enjoy writing about this. I'm going to be writing about all this stuff going forward, uh, and uh, there's so much to talk about and so much happening that. You know, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm glad to get out and, and be at conferences and talk about things. I'm having a blast. I think this is a really exciting time, and we work in an industry that really is changing the world. Yeah. And uh, uh, and it is a, is a blast to cover, and it is never a dull moment. Well, in all seriousness, not just because you're sitting here, um, people will be amazed at your handsomeness. But besides that, truly... You find the way to talk to more people. It's very thought-provoking. It's never pandering. I absolutely am addicted to your uh, periodical and your website. And I really appreciate you coming in. And I know we'll have you uh, at some other times in the future. But thank you for coming in today and joining me. You're very welcome. I had a great time. All right. Good morning, everybody. See you.